How's the air up there? Self-made. Fake. <laughs> so, how do you get up there? And how do you get down there? Hmm. Don't fall. Are you not afraid at all? Are we not afraid at all? Somehow, we've heard that more often lately. And here's, here we are, Daria and Justus. And last summer, we traveled 1,000 kilometers by these bikes through Germany. And our story started with the topic of fear. We are living in Germany. Here we have no war for 70 years, no hunger, super well healthcare, but somehow people are afraid. For example, parents are driving their children to school by car because they think something could happen to them. And moreover, people are afraid of their Wi-Fi router emissions. It doesn't fit together, <laughs> as you can imagine. And our living conditions are improving, but fear seems to increase. See, we've been living in here in Halle in Saxony-Anhalt for the last couple of years. And here would he could experience some of the most popular, most direct consequences of this fear. And that's when normal people start to call out for the deportation of refugees. And they still consider themselves to be normal and to be righteous and peaceful. And this hostile mindset is more than just a news spot on TV. It's real and it's growing. As you can imagine, we are a bit worried about the future of our society. And we are wondering why aggression is spreading in our community. So um, we see that a lot of people are focused on themselves and their territories. And their main motivation for that is fear. We wanted to find more about it. And then a plan popped up in our mind. We wanted to do something personally against this fear. And then we would like to give the courage back to the world. We think there is no need to be superhero to start a movement. And maybe everybody can start step by step in their own region. So first of all, we ask ourselves, what are our resources? Actually, Justus, for example, builds funny bicycles. And he travels a lot. And Daria makes films. And she travels a lot, too. If we use the both resources, we would make a tour on our tow bikes, self-built, turning a movie, and then we would be the two tow bikes for Mark Courage in this world. Seems nice. But there is a one tiny little problem. It's quite difficult to speak to German people because they are not talking to strangers that easy. Or even ask them for an interview, it's already a lot. <laughs> so we had this little trick. Ta-da! Our tall bikes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now, as you can see, yes, this picture is um, shot in this very town, Halle, 1896. So tall bikes are not at all our invention. Um, they have long been built by many bicycle enthusiasts all over the world now. And if you want to become one of them, you can just search for how to build a tall bike. It's not that difficult. And um, the effect is totally worth it, because everywhere you pass on a tall bike, people are instantly happy. And that's what we wanted, because when you know this problem, when you are somewhere and you want to start a conversation with somebody, and you don't know how, and you look for an excuse, you don't need that excuse anymore when you have a tall bike with you. Everybody is happy, and they start to talk to you all by themselves. And therefore, we talk to a lot of people that we would probably never have been talking to otherwise. Um, that's what we think we can use a lot for our political discussions. When you know these images from demonstrations, or you have been to demonstrations, there are a lot of highly motivated people, and they all have opposing but super strong opinions. And some of them might shout, Nazis out! And even if it's correct, and that made super clear that Nazis are unacceptable. But sadly, we know that 
nobody has yet been convinced that what they're doing or thinking is wrong just by yelling at them, get out. Because um, the fronts are too strong, people stop listen listening, and that way they unlearn to rethink our arguments. But tall bikes are easy and peaceful, and everybody finds at least something to agree upon them, whether it's technology or this circus aspect, or they just want to try them. And that's how you can start to talk to people. And that's probably a good way of new activism, and that way we were ready and our field research could start. Yes. So here you see some people we met coincidentally on our way. The others were experts we asked for an interview because they had a certain connection to fear and courage for, through their jobs and life. And our tour went through Berlin, where we were at the fear department of the Charité. Then we met Gabi. She was imprisoned in the GDR and for an escape attempt. Later on, we were in Hamburg on the biggest black labor road in Germany. We will tell you more about it. And last but not least, in the forest of Hamburg, where we met a lot of activists and talked to them. But um, before we are talking about fear, ah, no, back to the tour. Our journey led us to darker areas of Germany, to Hamburg, exactly to a place called Bildstraße. This is an industrial style road on the edge of town somewhere, but it's not famous for the import and export businesses, but it's very famous for the fact that all the people who don't have a permission to work in Germany, they will still find work there. And when we arrived, nobody wanted to talk to us. <laughs> that's understandable because um, those people have a very insecure status in Germany and that's why they're very, very vulnerable. Vulnerable to exploitation, that happens a lot in this black labor genre. And also a lot of police officers pass by wearing street clothing. And that's why those guys there are very um, careful. But we went to the end of the road and when we entered a small bar we felt some kind of hostility. Okay, still normal, but we got ourselves a lemonade and we sat outside waiting. And that was a point when the magic of those tall bikes it striked again. And the people got interested. And finally they asked us like, whether they could try. And of course we had to say yes, like please go for it, but please bring them also back. We need them for the rest of our tour. But then we saw our bike right away and riding far away and it turned into an alley. And then it disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got seriously worried. But after 15 minutes, they brought it back and we laughed a lot and we exchanged pictures and even this small group collected money and they made a donation of about two euro, which was uh, super kind. And um, the key question of this experience is, how can we transfer this concept of starting communication and this concept of overcoming our fear, how can we transfer this to our whole society? Well, maybe? I can tell you. Okay, first have a look on the fears in the German society. Statistics are helpful. First of all, violence, unemployment, terror, and Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump indeed is frightening, yes, but... Yeah, I think also. Um, let's start with the violence. The official police report shows an annual decrease of violence each year. So terrorism would be maybe the slightest chance to harm you. And on the other hand, we might focus maybe more on the extended power of the police, which harms much more people in the last years. Then we can talk about unemployment. Everybody can imagine that the quick transformation of technology has a huge influence on our jobs. And some might have some horror scenarios where a huge robo arm is coming and grabbing your job, or a high technology computer brain is just taking your working space. And then, what happens then? You are unemployed. Everybody knows the pictures in the media which are repeatedly produced for showing unemployed people. They are like losers, a bit 
not enough smart, not enough pretty, have just bad luck. Nobody wants to be like them as they are shown. So we are fighting all the time to getting a high career, not ending up at the last and bottom of the society. And moreover, these pressured living conditions in Germany lead to anxiety diseases um, which increase. Is that the Charité even? Yeah, the Charité, we found it Prove out. It. Then um, we need to think also about our self-representation in the social media. Nobody would ever show ugly pictures or where you are sad. It's not possible. Usually you see always pretty beautiful people, your friends, and you are comparing yourself to them. It makes you unhappy if you are not as perfect enough as them. And the day ends, you go to sleep, and next to you is just your smartphone, where you can always check in the others and compare and continue. And this is how the fear enters your bedroom and your private life. Actually, back on the tour again, you also seem sad. <laughs> We are often asked why we do not wear bicycle helmets when we ride those high bicycles and whether we are not afraid to fall and to break our neck. But we are bringing courage. And when you bring courage, you don't wear a bicycle helmet because a bicycle helmet is a sign of danger. It suggests that cycling is a dangerous activity where you have to protect yourself. And nowadays, there's this huge campaign in Germany for helmets and for road safety. And in Germany, of course, people instantly start to shout out for an obligation. But we think that this blames cyclists, that it's their fault if they get hurt in an accident. And yes, at first glance, that's okay, correct, because when you wear a helmet, your head is better protected. But when you look closer, a helmet doesn't prevent accidents. And a helmet just protects your head while you're in an accident. And it doesn't change the super insecure status cyclists have on roads that are clearly meant for cars. And it doesn't change the fact that almost all of the dangerous bicycle accidents still happen in connection with cars. That's why we got the idea that maybe those tall bikes might be even safer than normal bikes. And yes, cars look out a lot more. They take a lot better care. And therefore, they are a much more fundamental protection than the helmet that shall guard your head when you get hit by a ton of steel. We wonder whether this campaign really is useful or maybe it's just fighting symptoms because when you want the people to do something good and you want them to do it safe, then you encourage them to do it and to give them the infrastructure. But yet, we made our tour almost 1,000 kilometers without a single accident, but still our tour almost failed. And actually, we thought it failed. It failed. Look at our Instagram. We are a young couple, very sporty, looking nice. The sun is shining everywhere. On each picture, you see people are getting friends with us. And I don't see any failure. But wait, in the last picture? OK, OK, I understand. How did the tow bikes get into the train? What happened in the gap between the last two pictures? And Instagram doesn't tell you. Of course not, because it was a shitty day. We cycled for over 90 kilometers through rain all the time. We were very pissed off because we couldn't find a place to sleep. We were hungry and we had to argue all the time. And after so much effort to build these bicycles, to getting through a tour over 1,000 kilometers, it was difficult to realize that we wouldn't make it into the next city to come in time to Düsseldorf for the next interviews. And we really wanted, but we couldn't. We had not enough power. So we thought about our possibilities. We could have maybe just separated, split up, being sad and alone and go home. Or in the last second to realize what is really important and that we don't need to reach every goal of our tour, for example, the kilometers and the speed. Maybe it was just more intelligent to think about our aims, which is just to be together 
bringing the next interviews and just finish it. So this is why our tall bikes ended up in the train in the last photos of Instagram. On this hard day, finally we made the right decision. Because this decision was not only good for our tour, but it was something that we learned for life. And it was exactly, exactly one something that all the people we had met on our tour had already tried to tell us. And it's the fact that when you are scared, that you have two possibilities, and the one is that you just freeze and you hope that everything will end, or you start to use your fear as a motor, and then you can start to analyze your situation, and you can start to analyze your fear. And in that way, most of the fears disappear. And of course, don't all uh, disappear. But those that doesn't disappear, there you can start to fight the reasons for your fear and you can start to work on it. Right now, fear is freezing our society. And there are only few people who manage to find the courage to stand up and do something against their fears, who do something against climate change and social injustice and hate. And we know that it's not easy to find this courage, especially when your society is spreading fear. We've done what we can do, that's building the tall bikes and making the tour, but that's not what we want everybody to do. That's not useful to ride on when everybody is riding tall bikes. We want everybody to think what it is that they're personally afraid of and what they can do about it and then how they can fight the reasons. And then, when we start to listen to the fears of other people seriously, then we can start to act together and we can start to think how we want to live and how we can achieve that. And that's when we can make a courageous change. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>